goals of the CI on the CI and ESS include transforming the state's IT infrastructure over the next 10 years, it's a long stretch, into a seamless, integrated, state-of-the-art backbone for managing and using the information collected and are generated by the state. So this is a monumental task. It's going to take some time to get this going. Overhauling our, our infrastructure, um, the way that it's been, is you know, like basically everybody's you know, hard work and effort to, uh, to turn it around. Um, deliver business functional services that are common across all lines of business mission activities and uh, feature the management and persistence of key shared data. When there is a commonality, whether it's document in imaging or um, you know other types of lowest common denominators that all departments do as business function security, networking, things like that, that's where we want to kind of bring these things together and sort of utilize one hardened um, system for delivering those types of communication and services. Uh, reduce and eliminate redundant investments and maximize the state's purchasing power. So previously, how we've been acquiring assets. Um, you know, in IT in the state, and we have not capitalized any IT assets, which is kind of odd for you know government not to capitalize any IT assets to use operating budget to do it. So what that leads to is you know departments buying stuff because they have to buy things for the lines of business. Um, people not taking advantage of enterprise agreements, license agreements, uh, technology PCs, uh, kind of wholesale discounting, whisker pricing, uh, things like that. And so the idea is if we can identify all of those activities, the purchasing activities that are going on, and consolidate those investments and without negatively impacting the schedule of delivery of those items, then we want to put that all under one um, package and put it forth so we can get the same stuff on a cycle that everybody has the same thing. These are 11 of the key projects that are part of the consolidated infrastructure. OneNet is our Backbone Network uh, is being upgraded to, uh, by David Fujimoto's team uh, to 10 gig, I believe, and then between state offices. Uh, it's also a consolidation of circuitry for um, our you know, T1s and all T3s and things like that that are coming in all of the state. We have new state data centers and network operations centers. That is under David Keene doing that project. And what the idea of this is, which we'll see later in this presentation, is a key a unique opportunity. Hawaii's in a, in a good place right now. Sunny has done a fantastic job of talking up the three-letter agencies in DC, the feds, and you know, DOD, and people who <coughs> want to use our infrastructure for their shared services, for their network, for their servers, for their data processing, you know, for satellite telemetry, data storage, things like that. And they're willing to use it if we build, you know, if we build our, our part of it. And why data centers are so important to us here is because it creates a presence on, on island uh, for us, that um, you know, if, if the internet goes down or transfer speed cables are cut, you know, we, we can still operate um, you know, for like our European or core business operations. And additionally, it's the, the network. To develop a secure network hub in the Pacific here in Hawaii is, is really our, ours to lose, essentially. Um, the, the U.S. needs a critical infrastructure partner to deal with secure networking coming from Asia over you know, to the mainland. And we have the opportunity to be that, that hub um, for all communications. And these kinds of, kinds of projects you see like Verizon and other, other you know, companies and Oceanic Time Warner, people are hardening their, their head ends and building NOx and data centers and things here and eventually going to build POPs here. And that just strengthens in our infrastructure in, in the islands and inter island. So this is critic, of critical importance and there are, you know, like I said, dollars and grants and things that can help fund us in getting, it, getting to this space. Um, so this is very, very important to Hawaii. The adaptive computing environment. Who's the cloud and the whole uh, integration? Yeah. So this is sort of a hybrid computing infrastructure where we utilize cloud resources off island. Virtualization. Virtualization in, uh, internally. Cloud resources on island, a private government cloud as well. Um, so very, I guess, highly effective in its use of resources and provisioning of those resources on demand and allowing us to like, you know, spin up servers for this task or for that or for disaster recovery or load balance and develop that kind of high availability environment. Um, as well as for sandboxing and, and designing mobile apps, which is most in a different area, but mobile apps is going to be chiefly important as a driver in Hawaii's in state, in the, state's, the way the state does business. Um, we'll talk about that in the broadband uh, brief later this afternoon. ICST triage. There are a couple items on the uh, table that involved some, some 
stuff that ICSD was working on or hadn't addressed, and we got money in the supplemental budget to fix those things. And so that's kind of what those the ICSD triage includes. Um, and ICSD meaning it includes the data center operations, all of our divisions and branches, uh, radio, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, radio improvements, that's what Bob, Bob will be back to finish out the other new network. And then very soon after the radio improvements are complete in the next year, we're going to embark on FirstNet, which is a whole separate project funded by the NTIA um, for us to do is design planning for an LTE-based broadband public safety first responders network on island. And it has to be highly available across all islands and connect back to the mainland, to their interoperable um, capabilities there. So that's one that's coming down soon, and I believe I might have Steve. Steve may talk about that, but we have someone actually with a broadband session, a video, um, one of the chiefs on the first stand board, and we'll speak more about that. Let's see. Government cloud and cloud hosting. We have to be agile enough to put servers in play, take them down, put them out there, move them around, um, as business functions and business needs sort of come online. There are so many projects that are going on in the state right now uh, in terms of upgrades and migrations and, and data, um, you know, open data, big data, and things like that. We need to have those kinds of resources to be able to provisioned very quickly and easily. So the idea is that we're doing a government cloud, and we're going to have our own virtualization servers that we will host in government uh, departments and, and agencies and data centers. And then we will also leverage local vendors, cloud offerings, as well as mainland cloud vendor offerings. So that runs a gambit of like your Rackspace, your Amazon, your um, you know, DR4 tree cement, um, cement system metrics, and a couple other ones locally here. So we want to really diversify our, our, our footprint so that we really don't have any downtime. And that's the key, to keep these things working. Because it's in, their, in a lot of the vendors, it's their business practice to have five nines or 100% one time. Um, you know, we need to leverage that. Because we can't get there on our own, just doing it ourselves. So it'll take, it'll take too long. Email in the cloud. Email in the cloud is a straight commodity cost saver. We should be able to reduce our, the state's email budget by $2.5 million a year in licensing just by doing email in the cloud. This is one of those ones that is a, a good first um, project to move to the cloud. Many organizations, corporations, and states have done it. Um, Utah's done it, I think Michigan's done it, a couple other people are doing it. UH obviously did it, moved to Google. Um, this is one of those areas where we want to get the most bang for the buck and minimize our amount of maintenance time on those resources and ensure that you know, we rely on SLAs with the vendors, service level agreements with the vendors that they take care of their business, what they're supposed to be doing. So we are very shortly coming out with an RFI for email in the cloud uh, in January. And we're going to take advantage of something else in that RFI, which is number 11 which is unified communications. There are some abilities in some of these email offerings uh, where they will give you, you know, conference <coughs> bridging, video conferencing, um, you know, you can throw your phone, phone to your cell phone and things like that back and forth, and office automation stuff. We definitely want to take advantage of that and see what people have to offer that could, you know, economies of scale that can get us there, you know, quicker. But really, at the end of the day, it's a big cost saver for the state. Um, the email team has done a fantastic job of maintaining everything through the years that we, the state has been running. And now it's time to just do the same thing, but in a different way, and save you know, half the budget. Repurpose some of that money for some other improvements. Collaboration. That's really about putting together portals, um, whether it be SharePoint or some other collaboration tools to um, modify and really streamline our workflow. Some of the processes and forms. I mean, some of us, you've seen so much uh, paper going around the state. You know? I believe the number was in PSB and ICSD last year printed 850 million pieces of paper. Last year, 850 million pieces of paper were printed last year in the data center. That, that, that was like an astounding number. That was like not even like our top year, I don't think. Um, collaboration. Um, form automation, getting some of these things plugged in with the ERP so that our, we're not filling out you know, the T205 and then printing it and then signing it and then scanning it and then sending it over to somebody and having them print it and then sign it and scan it and shred it and then recompile it and then put it back in the cobalt code and then it goes to the governor's office and it goes to BNF and then it gets lost. And then, you know what I'm saying? Just, we, we have to get around that, okay? <laughs> so, I think it's covers people. They don't lose, they don't lose stuff. But things have been lost in this process. So, um, 
No. <laughs> but it is, you know, I tell people when I look at it, um, paper is a system. When you look at emergency responders and disaster preparedness, you know, paper, fallback, maps, things, so that's a system, a system that people use. And it's so much better than, you know, stone tablets. <laughs> we, we are one step ahead. Well, that tablet's back then, yeah. Cool it's different, not, not like that tablet, it's actually a tablet. <laughs> <laughs> Records and content management. Wow, this is, this is something that affects many, many departments with archives to um, state of historic preservation and all of our archaeological stuff, um, timesheets, everything. We have so many paper records that are not being stored. I, I use this story of, um, on Maui, they converted all the permits to, the county converted all the permits to a permitting database. And they did it up until 19, uh, like 1990 or something like that. <clears throat> and, you know, they couldn't put more of them in because the paper was in a floor in one of the old buildings that was condemned. And the paper was so heavy on the floor that it ended up con condemning the buildings not safe to go into. So all those records are stuck in a building but no one can go in to get them. It's a very real, uh, problem. <laughs> you know, so it's one thing that when, you, when you walk into a room and you have 30,000 pieces of paper and you get scanned and <coughs> into a database, but it's quite another thing when you can't even get in the building because it's it's so heavy the floors are collapsing. <coughs> yeah. um, the other idea with content management is everything that we do we manage is content, you know, based. And so getting more nimble with how we manage content, how it flows in and out, and um, whether it's, you know, when we do something great, getting it out to the press and getting it out into the Google, you know, into the blog space and getting it notified on the uh, on the search box and things like that. I mean, that's the kind of stuff we have to do. We don't. The state doesn't do enough of a job of, um, you know, coming out and declaring a victory over some of the projects they've completed. Just right onto the next project, right? We've got to elevate some of that some of that PR so that we get when we complete projects that we get it out there. And the content management systems help us to do that. And that's part of the website innovation, remodernization that uh, Karen Higo is working on um, most recently is still rolling these things out. Because it's in a new platform that makes it so much easier for us to, to in fact, roll those types of things out. The next one is geospatial information systems, or GIS. You may have heard of this. Um, DBET Planning Office has primarily, primarily been the user of this, and the State Civil Defense has used it a little bit. Um, but what this is, is, you know, in the digital map, essentially. It's creating a location for an image or a location for an activity, putting it on a map, creating context for a sort of an operational or situational awareness, okay? So how we use those tools, how we've used them in the past, like we've collected a lot of things. We've, uh, DBIS put a whole bunch of GIS um, shape files out for people to download and we have our open data initiative. People can download all kinds of stuff. But no one's really using it to do any analysis, you know? David's gonna start, David King's gonna start using the data center. Where up the data center? Where is it out of um, a flood zone? Where is it out of the tsunami zone? Uh, what is the average rate of rainfall, precipitation? These words of sunlight, if you try to do some uh, PVs on it. Like using this information, this geographic information in a way that is useful to us. Um, in the broadband project, we're gonna talk about later, that we, we use GIS a lot to analyze where the people are and relative to the uh, infrastructure. Um, where are trans Pacific cables going? Uh, where inter island cables go. Um, these are important things because when one of those gets cut or dropped, um, the whole you know internet goes down for an entire island for all day. So that's sort of an unacceptable scenario. And then unified communications is really focused on putting all of our communications into a, a workflow that is easy to manage, so it's not necessarily all email and all voicemails and you know all these inter office transmittals and things, but it really is a way for us to get key information to individuals quickly, easily, um, just what they need next, sort of just in time as they call it, right? Communications, and then moving it, um, move out of the space so we can be more productive in, our, in, in how we work. Okay, so I bring up this now, this idea, this concept, I want you guys to <coughs> see. This is the map. Uh, Oahu's Ahakuas. This is the land division system that Native Hawaiians used, right? And you can see that they go typically from the mountaintop down to the ocean. Um, and this was, you know, how they divide up land for water resources and how to get to, you know, when you plant bananas here, you plant taro here, you plant these types of other things here. So not unlike this Ahapua, this IT ecosystem, our consolidated infrastructure needs to work in the, the same way conceptually. 
So, for instance, if you're coming from the top of a mountain down, and we bought or we put in a state-owned high availability data center in Knock in the bottom left corner, and David King builds that, buys enough land with you know state money or has enough state land to lease other buildings to Fed, uh, city and county, or Dot Mills, or whoever wants to lease some space and put some buildings on there, and then other take advantage of other energy security initiatives out there with the Fed, where they're saying, okay, we'll build you a three megawatt. Um, power grid independent of HECO, right? And so then you feed that into this space. You put up an LTE antenna, make sure you have redundant fiber coming in and out, make sure you have redundant electrical on the local grid, <clears throat> and you have a fully self-sustaining um, infrastructure there for IT, consolidation, communications, data center, networking, um, data sharing. <clears throat> and you take that, and you divide them up, and you put them all over all the different islands, and now we've this is showing sort of inter-island cable loops uh, with fiber, and that is how you create a redundant load balanced um, IT architecture so that we don't have to worry about if the data center goes down on Honolulu, Maui can pick, take the load, or Big Island can take the load, or Kauai can take the load. Uh, it helps us for our disaster recovery, it helps us for um, you know, just basically operationally. Uh, the more we have to be involved in situational awareness types of matters with climate change, and, disasters and things like that. It's extremely important that we have these kinds of resources available to us on the different islands. So our roadmap really consists of building capacity and redundancy in the state's IT network, which doesn't currently exist. Um, deploy scalable computer resources to multiple locations, and that can be VMware, you know, Blade technology, virtualization, migrate applications and services to the government cloud. I mean, once we have these resources and assets and we can move them around, let's start migrating some of the applications out of um, <clears throat> maybe some of the mainframe apps, maybe some of the Lotus apps. we we'll bring them out and put them into um, a shared services architecture, shared services bus. Uh, consolidate our circuitry and other commodity-based cost items like email, unified communications, and maximize our savings. You know, this circuitry issue is a big one. I mean, that's, that's usually where you can find the most cost savings um, anywhere when you do an IT projects is that, you know, ours, Circuits and frame relays are probably the most expensive in the country, the, one that, the ones that we use here in the islands. So um, that's a good one to look at for cost avoidance. Promote content and information exchange. Uh, citizen engagement is involved in that. You know, a feedback loop with the public um, that we can be responsive to within, like, let's say, 72 hours and you know, address issues as they come up. Um, build critical infrastructure, data centers, and network operation centers. And improve homeland security and public safety interoperability. That one gets a lot of attention on the federal level, um, a lot of dollars behind that. Uh, certainly our own DOD um, and State of Defense, everybody are aware of, of these types of things, and that is a key funding mechanism for getting our, our hardening our infrastructure here. So over the next two years, uh, the issue of implementing consolidated infrastructure and enterprise shared services becomes one of really establishing a pervasive awareness of the government IT service portfolio. If the departments know what we have to offer, and it's on the menu, on the card, and they can choose and pick what they need, what they want out of that. It's going to be that much easier for them to spend their spend their dollars and get their equipment that they need like really quickly. Um, so part of putting all these, inventorying all these things and building them is to create a portfolio of services that are available to everyone. Uh, connecting the state's departments with each other in the world. It's not just about. Um, connecting us up with each other so we can talk to each other. We, we have to communicate outwardly and work on service. Um, improving the, on the diversity and mobility of that connectedness. Mobility is coming into play uh, in a big way, in basically in the whole IT ecosystem in the world. Um, you know, more, more mobile, more, was it, I believe the study was said something like more mobile, more, pe more people will connect to internet through mobile devices than through PCs or laptops, you know, by, I think it was 2012. It already happened. <laughs> Who knew? So got that stone tablet. <clears throat> you know, or like mobile devices outsold tablets, outsold PCs, I think in 2010. Something like that. There's a lot of statistics like that that are really uh, scary. So in, when the public can connect to their state and the services provided through mobile devices or with that kind of mobility, we, we provide great value, essentially. Um, we want to attract the world's attention to Hawaii as a technology innovator and mission critical communications resource and become a highly success accessible, highly secure strategic communications partner in the Pacific region. This is really where, like I said, you know, Hawaii is the most isolated 
um, place on Earth, one of the most isolated places on Earth. And the fact that like internet traffic coming from Asia bypasses us now um, means that all of that, you know, cyber warfare, cyber attacks, and things like that just go straight to the mainland U.S. If they, if we get fiber that comes through here, we can securitize it and you know scan it and check it. Then that adds great value to homeland security and those types of things, and um, be very good for for the U.S. So that kind of ends the presentation. There are a tremendous amount of projects on the on the plate right now um, that we're going to, over the next six months, each of you probably will be touched to, hey, come and listen in on this or participate or give us your input on this because we really need to know what's going on in your department or in your area um, and how that rolls into the bigger project. So you can expect that over the next six months, I probably will get to know everybody in your name and uh, hopefully you guys all remember my name, and we can uh, sort of get these projects going. But the first deliverables are due in terms of like data center equipment for uh, government cloud hosting and stuff like in mid-January. So stuff is ha really happening. The data center survey is coming back in mid-January. The federal data center energy grid survey is coming back in mid-February. I mean, lots of stuff is rolling out coming right after the first of the year, so things are happening. So, you know, I'll, one of the people in the audience said something that really wants to see some change, and while change is definitely happening. It might not look how you think it's going to look, but I'm telling you, it's, things, are, things are coming down the, the pipe, and you know, the procurement pipeline is just like chock full, and just, they're just rolling out uh, through SPO. So um, with that, I'll take any questions, if you guys have any questions, and Sonny and I can address 